My name is Matt Fry. Um, I am a journalist from the UK. I used to live in Washington for many, many years. And now I'm a presenter of Channel 4 News in the UK, and I'm also their Europe editor, which means that most of the time I get to spend covering political and economic disasters, but not natural ones. Um, although I have clocked up my fair share of natural disasters over the years. And actually, as I was walking to this meeting through the beautiful spring sunshine of Washington, I was mentally doing the math, as they say here. And I think I've covered altogether five earthquakes, two tsunamis, five super typhoons, four super hurricanes, um, three severe droughts, two wildfires, and one swarm of locusts. I'm not kidding. <laughs> that was in Australia, I think, in the year 2000. Um, and I think in all those cases, um, covering them as a journalist, one thing became very clear, that most of the destruction, most of the human casualties were not caused by the natural disaster event itself, but by the lack of preparedness, by the bad construction, by lack of communication, uh, and all the things that we are here to discuss today, how we can improve. Um, and there's an amazingly salient fact here, which is, um, I think, thanks to a World Bank study, that 9% of the natural disaster events of the last few years have been caused in low-income countries, but 48% of the casualties were also in those countries. So there's an obvious point for discussion. <coughs> Um, let me tell you about the next hour and a half. We're going to have uh, two speeches to kick off with um, by Justin Greening. She's the UK's uh, Secretary, for, Secretary of State for International Development, followed by um, the Norwegian Foreign Minister, Berge Brende. Did I pronounce that correctly? Brilliant. Brilliant. Fantastic. <laughs> I've been practicing all day. Um, and then we're going to have a very distinguished panel, which I shall not introduce right now because there are too many names uh, on behind me here. And then we will uh, finally have um, if, uh, some words from the, the administrator of the USAID, Rajiv Shah, here in, the, in Washington. But let me start off, first of all, by introducing um, Justin Greening, who is, um, as I said, the Secretary of State for International Development. But more importantly, she is my local MP. She is the MP for Putney. And therefore, an immensely uh, crucial figure in my life. <laughs> and we're going to talk about the parking issues on Chelverton Road later on. <laughs> Forget disaster relief. This is far more important. Um, anyway, she's, uh, she's uh, very committed to this subject. She's been doing the job since um, 2012. Be before that, she was uh, economics minister of the Treasury. Is that right? So a wide portfolio. But this is very close to her passion. And she will now tell us about her vision for disaster relief and how to improve it. Justin Green. Thank you very much, uh, Matt. And uh, as the local MP, I always help my constituents. I have a, a surgery every week, and I think you can book yourself into that, and we can, we'll be very happy to talk about uh, parking. But it's fantastic uh, to see everybody here today. Um, I know that I'm in a room filled with people who are absolutely committed to this vital issue of disaster resilience. And I've got, before I really get started, three thank yous. First of all, a big thank you to Rachel Kite from the World Bank for being our host today. It was about a year ago, really, that Rachel, Helen Clark, Valerie Amos and I visited Haiti in our role as political champions for disaster resilience. And I know how passionate Rachel is is about tackling the causes, but also the consequences of climate change. I'd also like to thank Matt Fry of UK's Channel 4 News for chairing the meeting. Then finally, I did want to thank uh, my colleagues in the Department for International Development, who are both in Whitehall, but out on the ground, uh, the people that the UK sends and works with to do our response to international disasters when they hit. Um, they do an amazing job. Um, they never get thanked quite enough as far as I'm concerned. So uh, can I also take this opportunity to say a huge thank you to George Turkington, uh, Nick and the team for all of the work that you do. I think when you look around the world today, you really do see, though, the humanitarian system being pushed to its limits, uh, whether it's Syria, whether it's uh, Central Africa Republic, whether it's South Sudan, where conflict rages uh, in the Sahel, where there's a protracted crisis that has now led to chronic, chronic food insecurity, <coughs> or in the Philippines, which we saw recently devastated by Typhoon Haiyan. And with humanitarian need 
quadrupling in the last decade. There really is a growing gap now between needs and resources. And the reality is that we're facing ever more demands on the system as we deal with the effects of a changing climate, growing populations, conflict and extremism. And the scale of that challenge that climate change presents was really laid bare in last week's publication of the latest intergovernmental panel on climate change and their report. And we know that the likelihood of more droughts and more floods will also mean that future food supplies get threatened, invariably hurting the poorest. There's also increasing challenges around getting aid to civilians under fire, with humanitarian access in conflicts like South Sudan shrinking, making our job ever harder. That's why the UN Secretary General has called a World Humanitarian Summit in 2016. And it's why it's so important in the lead up to that summit in 2016 that we hold the same level of debate and discussion on how we address humanitarian need as we're currently having about the post-2015 development goals. So holding this discussion in this forum is absolutely vital. And I'm delighted to have the opportunity today to contribute that, to that debate and set out what the UK sees as some of the key challenges and opportunities ahead. At DFID, we're taking a comprehensive look at our own humanitarian work to see how we can make our responses even faster and more efficient. We've identified five key overlapping areas that need our attention and focus. But these are also issues for the international community to grapple with in the build-up to the 2016 summit. The first crucial area is preparation. For the most part, disasters are no longer the unexpected cataclysms of old. The science of predicting and understanding risk is getting better every day. Bangladesh is perhaps the most famous example of countries being increasingly prepared to deal with disaster. In 1970, Cyclone Bola killed half a million people in Bangladesh. It was the largest number of people killed in a tropical storm ever. In 2008, the same magnitude storm in the same area killed 3,400 people. The difference was that in the intervening years, Bangladesh had built a comprehensive system of disaster management. Only last week, I was in China and I had, to, had the chance to visit the excellent National Disaster Reduction Centre in Beijing, which is working with DFID to further improve resilience in Bangladesh. And yet, in spite of the world's efforts, current global investment in emergency preparedness is woefully low. In fact, an analysis of 12 low-income countries over a 20-year <coughs> period revealed that while these countries had received $5.6 billion of funding for disaster response, they'd each received less than $10 million for disaster risk reduction. So we urgently need larger sustained investment in preparedness and resilience. And this is the right moment to be looking at this with the successor to the Hyogo Framework for Action for Disaster Risk Reduction that's due to be agreed in Japan next year. And today, I'm announcing that Britain will fund a £40 million disasters and emergency preparedness programme to improve significantly the quality and the speed of humanitarian response in countries at risk of natural disaster or conflict-related humanitarian emergencies. This funding will go towards training, and development for local humanitarian workers at a national level. National preparedness systems will also be strengthened and plans for at-risk areas improved. This includes better early warning systems, better communication channels to let workers and people know when there's a risk and what they can do to protect their communities. I'm also pleased to announce today that my department is investing £20 million in the first ever joint UNICEF and World Pro Food Programme Disaster Preparedness Project, which is going to improve the effectiveness of humanitarian responses in 11 high-risk countries and regions, including in Pakistan and the Philippines. That's about stocking and pre-positioning relief items locally so humanitarian responses can kick off immediately after disaster hits. I'm also keen to help scale up the level of insurance in lower-income countries using public-private partnerships and showing that there definitely is a role for the market in being better prepared. 
In developing countries, just 5% of direct losses are insured, compared to 40% in developed countries. And as part of the political champions agenda, this July I'll host a meeting in London with key insurance companies and donors to try to mobilise resources for a set of insurance investment plans that are being developed, including for the Philippines in the wake of Typhoon Haiyan. The second area that we've identified is supporting national and local leadership in emergencies. At the moment, international response to disasters tends towards a one-size-fits-all approach. I believe we now need to rethink how we can tailor the response to different solutions, different situations better. For natural disasters, the primary aim must be, as much as possible, to support countries to manage disasters by themselves, drawing on civil society and private sector support. My department's already contributing £30 million over three years to the START Fund, which is a network of NGOs which will provide fast, small-scale funding to frontline civil society organisations, particularly during the more low-profile, underfunded emergencies. This will also free up the UN to focus its resources and expertise on the most critical missions, where a national or local response simply isn't possible or sufficient. The third important area that we've identified is the need to create a more accountable, transparent and demand-driven system built around the needs of the most vulnerable. This will sound obvious, but for many years there really has been a tendency to do what we think is best for people rather than listening carefully to what their needs are. Girls and women in particular have suffered from a failure to get to grips with their specific uh, needs during emergencies. And in the past, even simple but important steps for preventing violence against women and girls, such as having separate toilets for women that can be locked from the inside, adequate lighting at night, those are things that have too often been forgotten. And last November, governments, the UN, NGOs and civil society came together in London at our Call to Action event to sign a groundbreaking communique which is based on the principle that keeping girls and women safe is a critical priority in an emergency. But I think we can do more, much more, to empower those who are affected during emergencies to shape the response that they need. And increasingly, it's the people we help who should be driving how we work. But in order to do that, this people, the people affected by disaster, need to know who is helping them and what they're supposed to be doing. DIVID has led the way on aid transparency amongst donors. We were the first to publish data to the new standard from the International Aid Transparency Initiative. And our online development tracker tool on the web uh, allows people to see exactly how the UK invests in developing countries. And the UK will be piloting a new accountability monitoring system in emergencies, which will particularly look at how we can use technology to allow people affected by disaster to make their voices heard quickly and effectively so that situations and impact on the ground can really change to help them where they need it most. This brings me to the fourth area that I want to raise today. As humanitarian need grows, it's clear that we need to find new and innovative approaches building a 21st century approach to disaster response. It's vitally important that we're we take advantage of the new opportunities through technology, particularly mobile phone technology. After the Haiti earthquake, aid workers used the crowdsourcing software Ushahidi to locate pockets of need. And we can expect that trend to continue. As more and more people across the planet own mobile phones, we'll be increasingly able to work out in real time where there's the greatest need and what people actually need doing during emergencies. Though not every innovation, I have to say, that we're going to invest in needs to be high tech. Sometimes it's about just getting the basics right. So at DFID, we're continuing to invest in innovations like stronger, more flexible shelter kits. Innovation is also one of the ways that, uh, is also about the way that we do things. And one of the best ways of supporting populations affected by disasters is simply to keep local economies and supply chains going. That's the means by which people ordinarily get their food and other essentials. So keeping those uh, economies, those supply chains flowing as normally as possible is key. 
And while communities are rebuilding and getting their household incomes back on track, it makes sense to ensure that people have money in their own pockets for life's essentials. Cash-based schemes can provide people with choice. So if they need a blanket rather than, rather than a cooking pot, they can purchase what they really need and what their priorities are. Over the winter just gone, we are funding jointly with ECHO a winter distribution uh, in Lebanon in order to, for Syrian refugees to buy cooking stoves and fuel. They can also be more cost effective because they cut down dramatically on storage, management, distribution costs. And today I can announce that DFID is commissioning an expert panel of leading finance, technology and aid experts to assess how cash-based assistance can best be delivered in emergencies and in particular how we can ensure we've got the institutional arrangements in place to move fast. The final critical area that I want to highlight today is the development challenge for countries that we know are vulnerable to disaster and conflict. These are the places where extreme poverty will be increasingly focused. And since we know that we'll be involved in assisting people in crisis for some time to come, it's right that we take a long-term, joined-up approach to predictable and protracted problems. So that's what DFID is doing. In Ethiopia, for instance, we've set up so-called safety net schemes. These identify where communities are likely to be vulnerable to bad harvests or other shocks, and they ensure that we can intervene to prevent starvation and help out situations before they deteriorate even further. Those sorts of schemes have so far proved extremely cost-effective, and in fact, in 2011, they were part of how the drought in Ethiopia was prevented from becoming a food security crisis. I can confirm today we're also scaling up this approach in the Sahel by allocating £47 million towards a new trust fund managed by the World Bank, working with Burkina Faso's government, and in Chad, Mali, Mauritania, Senegal, and Niger. And I know the UN is also starting to take this approach through multi-year planning. But we still need to do more, and that means working smarter. A recent Overseas Development Institute report points out that too often our funding instruments for developing countries, be it humanitarian, development, or climate finance, are working in isolation of each other. So we urgently need to break down these barriers. And I'd like to set a challenge today. My department's willing to work with one or two at-risk but committed countries to come up with a long-term plan of what it would really take to build the preparedness and resilience. This would see us integrating current and future planned finance from humanitarian, development, and climate change communities, identifying principal gaps and financing them. And I hope the World Bank, together with the UN and others, will be part of that challenge. I hope to pilot this approach in the right country with the right partners soon. So in conclusion, I've set out some of the issues that our humanitarian system is facing today. But there's no doubt that there are many more questions that we need to ask ourselves ahead of the 2016 Humanitarian Summit. Our humanitarian system does some amazing work. There is no doubt about that. And the UN, in particular, has done a hugely impressive job trying to keep pace with growing humanitarian need and reducing the death toll from disasters. But as I've outlined today, the demands on the system are getting greater, and when the scale and variety of challenges we face are combined, it's clear that we're running out of time to get our collective act together. Our current humanitarian system is too fragmented. UN agencies understandably want to maintain their independence, but none of us wants that to be at the expense of a less effective res response and a streamed, effective international system led by a strong UN is in all our interests, as are well-coordinated donors prepared to commit funding in advance to give UN agencies the best chance of doing a great job. We all saw great improvements in the international response to the Philippines, but we all still have further to go. So, as I've set out today, tackling humanitarian need is not just the sole prerogative of the humanitarian system, we need a greater emphasis on supporting host governments and local civil society to prepare for and manage disasters themselves. And it's critical that we build long-term approaches in fragile and vulnerable states, 
blending development and humanitarian finance. That's the challenge for all of us. We need to ask tough questions, try radical new approaches and scale up the best solutions. But the neediest, most vulnerable people on this planet are depending on us and we can't let them down. Thank you very much. Uh, fascinating speech and uh, lots of points raised there which we will pick up in our panel discussion later on. But next it is my, my honour and pleasure to introduce the Foreign Minister of Norway, Berge Brende, who's got uh, a very brief speech, he tells me. So not a caffè latte lungo, but more a sing single shot espresso. In response to Justine. Please. Thank you so much. Um, I'm heading off uh, to another speech, but I could not uh, miss this uh, great meeting uh, because this is addressing some of the core and most critical pieces that have to be in place if we're going to reach our all goal to eradicate all extreme poverty by 2030. That is not possible without building resilience. That is the best investment you can do uh, in making countries prepared. And we should also make sure that this is not seen as kind of an ordinary um, piece on a budget, because the yield when you invest in preparedness is unbelievable. The cost of action is far lower than the investments you can make. And um, we need to make sure that this is now also part of a comprehensive policy to be prepared for also much tougher weather and more natural disasters, unfortunately, coming out of climate change in the coming years. I'll give huge compliments to my colleague, uh, Justin Grinning, for then uh, pre presenting a very comprehensive uh, policy uh, on this. This is something that is also very uh, important for uh, Norway. Personally, I've also uh, seen on the ground, for example, in Haiti, that Justin also mentioned how badly one can be affected if you're not prepared. The same kind of uh, earthquake was also hitting San Francisco at the same scale. There were very few houses that were destroyed uh, in that, uh, in the way it happened in Port of France. And the lives that were lost were 60, 70 lives compared to 300,000 lives that were gone in five minutes in part of France. But one of the paradoxes when you then start to rebuild um, in a country like Haiti is that so far we've not been even able to build back better. We are building back, but we are in fact not building back in a way that these societies are better prepared next time. And I, for me, this is a great paradox. I was there, uh, Secretary General of the Red Cross uh, back then, and we were running field hospitals and seeing that the shelters that were, we were building uh, there were not the kind of shelters that should have been uh, built. Because if it hits Haiti again, um, they're not better uh, prepared. The IPC uh, last report, uh, shows us that um, we also need to be preparing for uh, fundamental changes and we need to look at the future rather looking uh, at past events. I think uh, the staggering changes we have not totally internalized yet and it is, and my feeling is that we've, we are too much uh, rearranging deck chairs on Titanic and we are not really preparing for the events that will be hitting us. We need to also uh, promote the culture of uh, prevention and preparedness. And we, as I said, we need to start treating preparedness and prevention as measures as investments in our common future and not on given budgets. I know we have a, a great panel here, so uh, since this is uh, one of the most important topics uh, in DC today, I just wanted to uh, share those thoughts uh, with you, and good luck 
uh, to the panel. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you very much. Excellent. <clears throat> We're going to have a small hiatus while the panel gets mic'd up, and uh, I think when most of them are here. And are we proceeding with the miking up? Is that okay? Excellent. We're just waiting for another few people, and then I think we can get going. Um, while we have the discussion, there'll be questions coming in. I think some of you might have tweeted questions in or sent them in by email, but hopefully we'll be opening this up to the to the audience a little bit as well. Um, but I'm not going to ask you to ask those questions. I will be reading them off a piece of paper when they've been handed to me. OK, I think we're slowly getting ready. All right, here we go. <clears throat> I'll get the end right. Okay. Okay. What should we say? Would we just start? Yeah, yeah just okay. start. Okay. As you can see, we are almost uh, complete, but uh, one of our colleagues uh, and a great friend and veteran of the bank, Ngozi Okonyi Iwala, is on her way down. She'll be here any minute now, but we're going to start with the, the miking up. And once we've sat down, I will introduce our distinguished panel. Thank you. Okay, we are a full house. Excellent. Okay. <coughs> Mike's all good? Excellent. Well, here we go. After that brief commercial interlude, we can now continue with our discussion. Let me introduce our distinguished panel. Um, Rachel Kite, to my left. Many of you will know her. She's a group vice president of the World Bank and special envoy for climate change. Mm -hmm. Next to her, we have Arsenio Balisakan. He's the Secretary of Socio-Economic Planning from the Philippines, and of course, therefore, has a very recent experience with disaster and disaster relief. Then, better late than never, we have Ngozi Okonyo <laughs> Iweala, the Minister of Economics and Finance of Nigeria, um, very well known to you at the World Bank here. In fact, if you forgive me, Ngozi, the last time I chaired an event with you, I think you were one and a half minutes late. So now, I so I'm, I'm doing better or worse? You're, no, I think you're getting slightly better, actually. No. Anyway, but it's, it's, it's great. It's fantastic that you're here. Um, we then have um, uh, Kristalina Georgieva. Have I pronounced that correctly? Very good. She's the EU Commissioner for International Cooperation and Humanitarian Aid. And last but by no means least, we have Kyoshi Kodera. He's the Vice President um, of Jap of, in Japan of, international, of the International Cooperation Agency, formerly also of this parish. And I think we have three... Um, former senior employees of the World Bank, I think all had the same job at one stage, but not at the same time. Am I right? Yes. Okay, there we go. Anyway, welcome to all of you. Thank you very much. And now, there's so much to go through, but I'd like to start off um, with you, Arsenio, if I may. If the Philippines had been better prepared before... Typhoon Hainan, and in what particular areas, would the damage that had been caused, which was not as great as some people had feared it might be, but nevertheless 6,000 people were killed, would, would that damage have been limited significantly? And what do you think, in hindsight, could have been done that you didn't do? The, the, uh, uh, the uh, typhoon, the super typhoon that hit the country was the strongest that we had in, 
in decades, uh, uh, and the the extent and uh, the de the breadth of the uh, of, of uh, the swath, uh, the wide swath of the affected areas was never uh, expected and never was never experienced in the past, and and so the institutions that we have in place. Uh, uh, we're not quite uh, prepared for that magnitude. Uh, we have had uh, institutional arrangements for ad addressing uh, uh, disasters, uh, 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 and especially those that are tailored uh, for uh, local response, uh, for local government units. Uh, but uh, the typhoon w uh, covered uh, and affected uh, uh, a wide, as I said, wide swath of, uh, of LGUs uh, and their in the regions and, and bigger units of, of, of governance, uh, mm -hmm. and so the uh, so the, the usual response and protocol and institutional arrangements simply uh, uh, collapsed, uh, and uh, that's, so that's what well, that's one uh, uh, measure. Otherwise, if it would have been isolated, an isolated case like what we had had in previous. Uh, uh, decay, uh, years, uh, which is, is quite the common uh, mm -hmm. that you experience every year, you could have uh, uh, easily handled that. So you're saying this is a particularly severe event, which you, even under the levels of preparedness you had before, you simply weren't ready for this one? Yes, this was uh, the, the last time we had this one in, re in our history was in, uh, in uh, 1912. Right. And, it, and then it happened again. So, but it, in hindsight, what would you do now that you hadn't done before that would prepare you for a, an event of similar severity the next time around? The lesson that uh, we have learned a lot from this yeah. uh, uh, experience. Uh, uh, one thing that uh, is so uh, 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 paramount it, it, it is the, the, nece the necessity of, uh, of responding quickly uh, to to the crisis uh, uh, that uh, uh, erup that uh, erupted, uh, uh, and that uh, because what happened was the the, hu the, the humanitarian needs, the the, the relief uh, uh, efforts that would have to be done, uh, would substantially uh, impact uh, uh, on the uh, fiscal resources of the country, uh, and what was uh, clearly uh, needed was for us to. Get the uh, the early uh, recovery, early reconstruction as fast as we could uh, to re to reduce the, uh, the 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 cost. Otherwise, what we have been working all along uh, in terms of getting the economy moving to a higher uh, growth trajectory would simply uh, be uh, undermined. Uh, and so it was crucial for us when we are looking at the numbers that uh, uh, were presented to us and the cost of relief operations every week. I said, if we are going to, to follow the usual protocol, which is let the relief operations finish, then you go for a post-disaster needs assessment later. And I ask, how long will that be? Uh, and uh, uh, the assessment we got was, let's wait for two to three months, and then we get the post-disaster needs assessment. So we're talking about four to five months before mm -hmm. we can get the, the relief uh, uh, the, the early recovery, and said so that was not uh, acceptable to us because ad otherwise the fiscal resources would then be so so high that we would never be able to uh, recover quickly from mm -hmm. that uh, 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 from the crisis. Let me ask you, Kristalina. I mean, what Justin Greening mentioned in her speech is that we now have an amazing ability to scientifically predict disasters. Um, and you know, if you look at most natural disasters around the world, they tend to come in, in, you know, you tend to get wildfires in one area and earthquakes in another, and sometimes the, you know, they coincide, but you know, there tends to be kind of a regional pattern to these things. So given the, the level of science that we now have at our disposal, given the level of communication through mobile phones and, 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 and the internet that is now at our disposal, there is really no excuse, is there not, for getting more prepared when it comes to the, 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 the staving off of the consequences of these events, which are increasing exponentially, we're told. Well, uh, two points. First, uh, just to go back to Haiyan, I was uh, in uh, uh, Takloban uh, a week after the, uh, the, the devastation that happened. And uh, 
what the mayor of Tacloban told me was, we built shelters to withstand wind 160 kilometers an hour. But this wind was 320 kilometers an hour. Mm. Then he also told me, we had communication systems in place that were supposed to be just fine. They all were wiped out. And we had to bring telecommunication capacity so we can reach out to people, let's not forget, a very, very dispersed um, uh, area. I would, as long as I live, I would not forget flying over the uh, devastation. And you can see on one side where uh, the environment was spared, people were spared, mm -hmm. paradise. And on the other side where it hit, hell. Hell. Uh, what I, we will take So are you saying that even preparedness, you know, we cannot be prepared because it's me, so severe. That severe. takes me to, the, you know, the, my conclusion is something that I have been saying. Think of the unthinkable. Prepare for events that we cannot even imagine are going to happen. And that means a very different mindset we have to incorporate that allows us to have the agility to respond, well, to prepare, to prepare. I mean, uh, uh, the lesson the mayor there drew was we have people living where they should not live. Yeah? Uh, that, that kind of enormity of disasters requires for us to transform the way we as society. But that's a huge ask, isn't it? It is a, it is a huge ask, and it is something that let me, let me tell this, this group here, is not a five-year, 10-year uh, proposition. This is really constant, eternal. It's like the job of the Pope. It okay. never ends. All right. <laughs> the job of the Pope. Ngozi, the job of the Pope. The, um, so you're the Minister of, of Economic Affairs and Finance in Nigeria. What you've just heard from uh, from your colleague, is that she wants much more preparedness, think of the unthinkable, restructure an entire urban landscape, you know, to prepare for uh, natural disasters. Is that really feasible, given the economic state of, of any country, not, not, not just yours? Well, I think first you have to ask, um, and I'll come back uh, to, to what happened in that part of the world. You know, people, human beings are very interesting. You have to ask if they psychologically feasible. When Sri Lanka, you know, there was the tsunami, and I visited, you know, Sri Lanka and all those coastal areas that were swept away. Believe it or not, this was before I went back to Nigeria, yeah. um, just my last year before I left the World Bank. In the same areas where people's houses had been swept off, they had rebuilt. Yeah. So you are talking of asking people not to live in certain areas. I was amazed. What they had done is they rebuilt in the same er areas, just that they built higher and better, you know, because some people escaped by climbing up to the rooftop and yeah. so on. So people now <coughs> build two story. But I was stunned that they would not move away. And, you know, they were literally right in the water or next to the water. So I think the big ask, human beings are very attached to the places, you know, the ancestral place or where they, they, they've been or where their families. So asking them to move away is a very tall order. So you have to think about, okay, if these people are going to live here, what are the adaptation mechanisms that can minimize the loss of life? And how can we have a more quick response type of situation, uh, to this type of situation? Because like Kristalina said, events are happening that sometimes <clears throat> you cannot imagine. And people say you shouldn't prepare for the once in a 50 year event. But you know, it's happening more and more frequently. So I think we need two things. One, adapt, adapt, uh, let the people there be able to do things, build somewhat differently, farm somewhat dif differently, and very quick response. And this is where I think what we've been able to do in Africa uh, recently is mm. something that I'm quite proud of in terms of saying, let us develop a mutual risk pooling system for the continent. It's been costing 
uh, the, the world about a billion dollars a year on average to take care of disasters uh, in, on the continent, be it droughts or flood. Mm. And this has been happening for 60 years, and we've not really changed our way of responding. You know, there's, it happens, you know, we call on humanitarian aid, we wait three or four months before we get it. By then, many people uh, have suffered and, you know. So it's cyclical, exactly, and we don't, we don't learn from our mistakes enough. But it's happening more and more. But yeah. then we, we I, I don't know if you want us to come back to this, because this is something I think I really want to share, that yeah. the, the Africans themselves have taken control with the help of DFID, uh, with, with the help of other donors yeah. like the Germans. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. 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 I, I think, okay. But I think this sort of this bottom up approach and self empowerment is very important. We'll get back to that a little bit later. I just want to hear from you, Rachel. I mean, we've all been saying, you know, the Philippines was an example of something that hadn't happened in almost 100 years. So here you have this very, very strong weather event. We're, we're told to expect more of these things. Is this, is this exceptional event going to become the new normal? And is that the way we have to now think of these things? Yes. Um, you know, I think, I think the scientists are very nervous about attaching any one particular event to uh, changes in the climate. But the trend is um, becoming quite clear. And what, what, what's, what we're interpreting that is that we are at, we are running a risk that we barely understand. We haven't programmed that level of risk into our economic or financial planning. I mean, Philippines has to, Tacloban has to build back better, build differently. You know, we have to build railway lines differently in the United Kingdom if we're going to expect that mm. kind of wind and, and, and rain and storm to lash over the Atlantic on a regular basis. Um, so it, you know, this is this is indiscriminate. It, you know, it's it's going to affect every economy, and we are ill prepared for the risks that we're running. I mean, that's the conclusive statement that came out of the scientists just a couple of weeks ago, and will come out again probably on Sunday in the in the next report. And I think you know, what do we know? We do know that in the Northwest Pacific, the ocean is you know a lot warmer than it was 20 years ago. So 20 years ago. If, a, if that kind of wind speed had moved across the ocean in the direction that it was, it, it, it would have hit the Philippines. It would, have hit, it would have caused damage. But with that kind of water temperature in the ocean, then the storm surge increases exponentially. And the storm surge has extraordinary damage. Now, yes, are there more people living in the Philippines? Yes. Are a lot of the poor people living in informal settlements? Yes. Are we building cities on coastal zones, especially in Africa and, and South Asia and Southeast Asia? Yes. Are they well prepared? No. Mm -hmm. you know, so we're, we're compounding, um, I think, a risk from, from what science is telling us we have in store. And we can, we can draw points and, and make correlations. And then the fact in, in the way in which we're urbanizing, the way in which we're living, and the way in which we're sort of pushing at the boundaries of nature's own protection for us, um, uh, whether it's uh, in the mangroves or in the, in the way in which we used to live on the land, you know, I think we're, we're, we're compounding a set of risks. So in what's the biggest culprit here? Is it Mother Nature, um, you know, changed by us through climate change, or is it increasing urbanization, or both together? You know, I, th I, think, I, think we're, I think we're dangerously mixing up uh, uh, an alchemy of, uh, of, of, of uh, ingredients in, in, a, in a way that we are not really uh, able to grasp at the moment, and the kind of financial and economic planning is going to need the kinds of innovations that Ngozi is leading with catastrophic risk insurance, which yeah. we've done in the Caribbean, we've done in West Africa, we've done in the Pacific, but it's going to, uh, it's going to I think, prov prov provoke a really profound conversation about, you know, a, 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 a penny here <coughs> saves a pound yeah. there. And uh, you know we know that you know we know that a dollar in, in, in early warning saves you thirty five dollars in in, uh, in in disaster response. We know that a pound of a pound of resilience it saves you four pounds of uh, of risk. Um, but that's not the way that we spend our aid today. That's not the way we spend our disaster resilience money today. That's not the way we're thinking about climate finance today. And that's not the way that any economy is really structuring itself today. Well, that's rather depressing. Well, no, because the only way to go is up, okay. right? All right, so yeah, that's another, very good. I like that optimism. Uh, let me turn it over to Kyoshi Kodera next. Um, I mean, I cover the tsunami in Japan, and I was amazed by the speed with which 
the clear-up began in the disaster areas. It was quite astonishing. Uh, in contrast with Haiti, famously the opposite case, and one of the interesting things in Haiti was a lot of people didn't clear the rubble away from their homes because that was the only proof of ownership. So there was a whole legal question there that we might get to later on. But what I'd like to know from you, um, uh, Kyoshi Kodera, is what did Japan learn from the last experience that has allowed you to change your levels of preparedness for whatever comes next? Well, good question. And uh, well, I have to say that was a once in a 500 years event and uh, uh, unthinkable. And uh, yeah. people are really got devastated, particularly in the Tohoku region. And also, the, we have additional complication of the Fukushima. And, uh, but I, I think not only the government and the local government, also the media uh, is keeping the, the, the try to, to raise the awareness of the people. Uh, our national broadcasting system, every day, around 7.30 to, to 8 o'clock, there will be a song coming out uh, commemorating the uh, March 11th event, two-minute song uh, sang by elderly people in the region, uh, the, uh, the, 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 the elementary school. <laughs> this the is boys. to keep people's awareness uh, yes, of what yeah, happened. Yes. So yeah. that is the everyday Lest thing. they not forget. So, yeah. And also the, the, the media's role is quite important. Every time meteorological uh, agency uh, uh, coming up, some of the, the, the forecast of what's going to happen to the, uh, uh, the Pacific uh, trough uh, uh, and uh, you know, we have a potentially or continue to be very dangerous situation. And uh, also, why the uh, uh, new governor of Tokyo, Mr. Ma Masazoe, won that election? He put the uh, safer city, safer Tokyo, as a top priority for his uh, campaign agenda. Mm -hmm. So the awareness, uh, preparedness, is almost everyday things for us. I mean, let, let me just read you this question. This is coming from the internet. Um, I'm not sure from where or by whom, but the question is this. When talking about resilience, is there too much focus on game-changing technology, but not enough focus on getting people to adopt this technology? Kristalina. I, I agree. The um, uh, criticality is to change mindsets, to think of education of kids to preparedness of adults, and uh, integrate this fully in our uh, societies, because none of us is immune against this danger. But to and be rather than being scared of it, yeah. we have to say, hey, this is something that we can learn from each other, we can do better. I want to tell you, Mike, because you were saying to, uh, to Rachel that, oh, that's very depressing. I actually, being a natural optimist, think that we have seen also incredible <coughs> examples of countries, communities, raising to this new challenge. My, my personal favorite is Bangladesh, mm. a country that has gone from losing hundreds of thousands of people to floods, to now giving very few casualties because they lifted up their schools, the schools are evacuation centers. They also have adapted their uh, um, economies in a very interesting way. Uh, for example, switching from chicken to ducks. Mm. Because the flood comes, chicken die, ducks swim. swim. <laughs> and that, I, I, I see it time and again. I see this adaptivity we have as, as, as human race. What we need to do is just embrace it, embrace it, lift it okay, up. OK, so these practical ideas, the chicken uh, and duck question, which is fascinating. I didn't, I mean, I, now that you mention it, it makes sense to me, but I hadn't thought of it before. Mm -hmm. Who comes up with that? Is that local intelligence from the farmers? Is it the EU Chicken and Duck Commission that comes up with it? <laughs> you know, is it the World Bank? Is it, you know, Rachel's crowd? You know, the, the think tank that says, right, you, you know. know. OK. All Nat of, native intelligence. All of the above. All of the, <laughs> all above. Of the above. Communities come up with, with very creative ideas. Uh, practitioners come up with very creative ideas. Uh, for example, in, in, uh, in Africa, in the Sahel, uh, roofs used to be flat. Yeah. Now they are curly, so when the rare rain comes, it can be then collected in very simple containers, 
changes dramatically uh, the livelihood of people uh, to very uh, high tech solutions. I mean, it is not, not only that. We in the European <coughs> Union, um, when we started this dialogue, we had the humanitarian community here, the development there. No policies on resilience. Now we are, what is it now, Rachel? Three years later? Two and a half years later? Two years later. We have policy on resilience. We program humanitarian and development funding for the countries that are most vulnerable together. Our, the share of, of projects with re resilient objectives in our humanitarian budget has gone up from 5% to 20, just by building day after day awareness. And we have a legislation in Europe that requires all our countries to do what the UK is doing, risk assessment, uh, very careful preparation for this new world. What is the best idea that costs the least amount of money when it comes to disaster preparedness. I'll throw this to anyone here. Uh, well, the, the, I mean, a really the, simple the, idea the, that was just genius because it didn't cost <laughs> a lot of money but saved a lot of lives. It, 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 is, it is there, and this is early warning. Yeah, early warning. Early, early warning is, to my mind, the most cost-effective uh, investment, the simplest idea. Uh, you alert people so they can, they can, they can uh, save lives. They go up on the hill, or uh, if it is floods, they prepare for them. Early warning, uh, and I'll tell you the simplest. Is there anybody from Haiti here? Uh, one of the most effective si uh, and simplest early warning that actually people there created was uh, red, red, yellow, green flags. They put it on the tallest roof, and it is green where there is no flood, no hurricane, nothing. Yellow if things are getting uh, bad and red uh, when, when it is coming. Very, very cheap. It basically costs, what, a dollar? But then you need to know where to go after this uh, red flag comes, and that, and that, is, that is a bit of uh, planning. But early warning is easier in low-income countries than in places like the United States. I mean, early warning here. No, but but I, well, I, I accept that I think that you're seeing incredible innovation. I mean, the, the other great example is in 1999 when um, the storm hit the east coast of India, Odisha, and um, you know 10,000 people uh, killed as a result. You know, just 10 years later, I mean, no, more than 10 years, but I mean, last year when they had a huge storm around about the same time as Haiyan, because they put all the early warning in place, and because they'd done various other things to the infrastructure, and they'd put community systems in place. Mm. And they had 72 hours, and they had a whole system, so everybody got warned, and everybody got out of the way. I think 50 people died. Yeah. Uh, now, there was a cost to infrastructure. And now what you're seeing is, and as the price of technology comes down, open data mm -hmm. is being used in the Kathmandu Valley in the same way that it's being used in the ninth, in, in, in the ninth district of New Orleans to actually crowd in the community's own data about who lives where, uh, what property is where, and you start to be able to build that in, and then that becomes terribly important, uh, A, in the, in, before the disaster hits, but then especially in the build back. What about in the gun? The education system is quite important. Yeah. Preparedness, education, and the sure. drills. And uh, <laughs> with early warning system, you know, education, Follow-up. So you follow have the early up. warning, yes. you've got the preparedness. Yes. The Evacuation. And Gozi, you want to add something? Yeah, no, I was just going to add that, uh, you know, one of the things I found most interesting is this, the project that the Rockefeller Foundation is doing with the 100 Resilient Cities uh, project, where, you know, mm -hmm. they are putting in asking cities to name chief resilience officers mm -hmm. in case someone is interested in applying in the audience or this post. Mm -hmm. But really, you have the person there who is there to think ahead, plan ahead, look at the city and how you can reconfigure the way business is done and the way people live. Mm -hmm. And these types of innovations we're talking about, you know. So I find that fascinating that now, given the frequency of what we see, we're thinking of arming and equipping communities with this kind of advanced thinking and innovation. Um, um, Asenia, I just want to know, in the Philippines, before um, the, the typhoon hit, what was the insurance cover in Tacloban? What was the percentage of, of properties that were insured? No, that's very low. Very uh, low. Very low. And, uh, and has that increased as a, as a result well, of the disaster? Uh, Microinsurance uh, is uh, 
spreading quite fast now in yeah. the country. Uh, uh, but it doesn't usually cover assets, uh, fixed assets. Uh, 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 but the, uh, this experience uh, uh, is telling us that we should uh, develop uh, mechanisms, uh, uh, financial assistance perhaps, mm -hmm. to, to uh, get uh, insurance uh, as part of the uh, arsenal of, of... And is that being discussed in the Philippines yeah, at the moment? It's being discussed at the moment. We are looking at uh, 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 safety nets and insurance at the household level, at the, uh, uh, at the local uh, uh, government level, at the national level, mm -hmm. and uh, even at the international level. We are looking at the, um, uh, for example, accessing uh, 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 insurance uh, the international marketplace, uh, uh, but uh, I, we are, uh, I think what would be very promising is, uh, it, uh, and we are exploring this with with, uh, with the World Bank. It's the setting up of uh, uh, climate uh, and resilience resil uh, and disaster resiliency fund, which would allow us to respond quickly to uh, to disasters that at the same time protect the the limited fiscal resources mm -hmm. such that we don't compromise uh, the, uh, the medium term, long term uh, uh, prospects of the country. Mm -hmm. Because what happens uh, in many <coughs> cases is that when you have a very serious disaster like that, uh, uh, the macroeconomic consequences could be severe and it would be very difficult to, uh, to recover. So the, uh, I, I think uh, uh, if we have funds uh, like that, uh, and we are looking at the uh, mechanism to set that up uh, that might uh, uh, give us more, uh, more uh, freedom to, to, uh, to respond to this. Disasters. So is the best opportunity for getting more resilient for the next disaster the disaster that you're living through at the time? So in other words, something like uh, Takloban happens. No, that it, gives you an opportunity to put things in place which would be much more difficult to put in place in a pre-disaster environment? If, if it's a localized uh, uh, quite, uh, uh, event, uh, uh, we have a system. Uh, uh, there are, uh, we have places in the Philippines where early warning uh, uh, programs uh, have done so well in protecting uh, villages and communities. The one we have in Bicol uh, uh, region, southern part of the country, mm. which are typhoon-prone areas. Every a uh, year that's uh, uh, hit by uh, serious typhoons. But uh, in recent years, they've been able to, uh, casualties have been quite limited. Uh, and that's the w one ex uh, uh, experience that we are trans uh, 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 using to influence mm. the other uh, areas in the country. I think, I mean, it's, it, this is a fascinating discussion, but, but so much of it is also abstract and idealistic. And I think I'd like to bring it down to practical measures, which I think we're pretty good at doing. But here's a question that's just come in. Resilience at what cost? What budget trade-offs should we make? What should we give up? It's a very fair question. Who would like to answer it first? <laughs> let, <laughs> on, let me ask, let me give someone else a shot. Ngozi. I guess I'm the finance minister here. Exactly. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, it's a good question, resilience at what cost? But I do want to share what the secretary from the Philippines said, which is that you know these disasters, if not well thought of, ahead uh, could really be uh, dis very fiscally disruptive. Mm. Um, and, and therefore, mm. countries uh, need to, to really think about that um, and prepare ahead. Because you know you can't put a, a price to life. When it happens, you know, and you need to rescue people and you need to treat, you know, finance minister cannot say that, uh, no, you know, we're not going to send the extra $2 million. It's too costly to save 100 lives here. But then, you but know, this you is about resilience at what cost? This is about yeah. how much money you spend before the event to make sure that the effects of it are limited. That is what I'm saying. That it's far better to think of what to spend uh, before the event and how to prepare yourself before the event. Uh, the problem that we have now is that these events that are, Kiyoshi said, one in 500 years, one in 35 years, one in 50. They are no longer one in that. There seem hmm. to be one in. I don't know, one in every two years or something. They are no longer long-term events. So it's becoming a very, very difficult and costly exercise to prepare. But I still believe that the incremental value from spending a dollar on resilience 
coupled with mechanisms to respond quickly when it does happen is the best way forward. And on practicalities, I will not let you get away this time without talking about this uh, ACK, the African Risk Capacity. I really do want to talk about it because I'm excited about the fact that African countries have said and come together to you know, develop a mutual system of bullying risks and saying, look, as part of this resilience, we are going to put in place a system of insurance, as Rachel said. I mm. mean, it's been done in the Pacific, in the Caribbean, but we've not done it. So for us, it's exciting and new. It's ours. We have donors who have come to support us. And the I initiative guess. came from? It came from the Africans yeah. with the help no, of WFP. The, it, it, it started <coughs> over there. Mm -hmm. We must give them credit. The World Food Program when Joseph Sharon was there um, as we were looking for solutions. But the idea that the AU took it over mm -hmm. and we now have, a, you know, uh, an organization with 22 member countries and we just presented it at the meeting of African finance ministers to raise awareness so that all the countries can join because the more countries that join, the cheaper it will be for everyone that is insured. Five countries have actually just taken out the insurance. And if we build this, what does it promise us? You know, it means that we will have a response and, you know, maybe up to $30 million, depending on the level of insurance a country takes, uh, that can be disbursed within two to three weeks because all the preparation is done beforehand mm -hmm. and certified. You have to show how you would deploy this money, who it would go to, so that when it does happen, all of that doesn't need to be done. You just get the money and you use it to save lives and restore livelihoods. And not a huge financial sacrifice for other parts of the economy either. It's, it mitigates that sacrifice right. and it mitigates the immediate disruption that happens. Rachel, this do you want to weigh on this? Well, yeah, I mean, I, 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 mean, I don't, I, you know, the decision on how much you, you put into resilience, you know, I, I don't know what the number is, but what we do know is that the, the, the price of the risk of the event is extraordinary. It's in percentage points of GDP. And if these events are becoming intensified and if they are coming on a, on a much quicker cycle, then if you're running at a risk of two or three, three percentage points of GDP being lost because of a drought, and that drought's going to be coming every three years rather than every five years, then at a certain point, the political system and the economic system will have to deal with that. And measures like this help. The other thing is that, you know, given that we're here at the World Bank uh, and IMF annual meetings, it has to be more than we're spending at the moment. For, e for every $100 of development assistance that we spend today, we spend 40 cents on disaster prevention and preparedness. Peanuts. And so it's, I don't know what number it is, but it's more than that. Actually, I'm glad you mentioned that because there's another question that's just come in, and it's very opposite. In a time of austerity, what are the best arguments to convince rich countries to divest resources or raise taxes to invest in other countries' resilience? Kristalina. Mm. Well, the, uh, the uh, argument is obvious. If countries are not prepared and they collapse, we have to then pay. we will have to come up with huge amounts of humanitarian aid. Mm. And that is probably going to be more than the investment in preparedness to begin with. Two, when countries collapse uh, and they cause all kinds of uh, problems to their neighbors, that destabilizing factor doesn't stay in this globalized world in one place. It moves. Uh, and I think that it is to my mind, obvious that it is not just morally right, and it is morally right to help people, uh, but in times of austerity, we actually have to invest more in reducing the humanitarian costs of the future, in reducing, reducing disruptances in the world economy. Remember the floods in Thailand, they costed 2.5% industrial, global industrial production. Chop. Uh, obviously, for us, uh, and actually, there was a, a in uh, in that particular case. No, in your case, when you had your triple disaster, when that happened, in the UK, uh, factories producing 
Honda had to go from five days to two days because sure. they didn't have the parts. So we are in a global economy. Uh, there, there's in a an global impact economy. There. We are but, interconnected. But what are the numbers, the, the raw numbers from the European ah. Union in the last few years since the crisis? Mm -hmm. uh, have, has, has the has the union spent more or less on resilience? Uh, we, we are spending more on uh, disaster preparedness, both inside the union and in our development and humanitarian. By, aid. Give me some percentages. And we are, I mean, in in uh, in humanitarian. In the humanitarian budget, I know it. I actually said it. Twenty percent. Right. We have a budget of 1.3 billion last year. Twenty percent of that was directed to uh, disaster risk reduction preparedness, uh, helping communities to withstand shocks. Uh, on in our development programs, we are starting to do better. Uh, and I'll tell you a very interesting example. We have this commitment of 1.5 billion for the uh, for the uh, Sahel. And we did the programming, and I was very worried, are we going to come up with 1.5 billion? We came up with 1.8 billion. I think there is now a much uh, higher degree of awareness that exactly because we have tighter budgets, we have to use our money wisely. And just to go to your question, how much we should invest? Well, it de depends on the risks. And, and this is where risk assessment is a crucial. hugely important, hugely important task. It will determine how much we And have. without that, the insurers aren't going to come on site anyway, no, right? No, no. So you have risk assessment, insurance, construction. I mean, there are, there are literally a dozen areas in which practical steps can be made and are being made to improve resilience. Yeah. yeah. Uh, you know, we are talking about the situation where we don't have money. But uh, let's start from very practical things. So the, my minimum kit is hazard map, uh, early warning system, and evacuation plan, mm -hmm. and education. This is really minimum. Then next, focus on the public utility, like hospital and the school. Uh, somebody mentioned about the uh, Bangladesh, and we also the, the focus uh, of uh, our operation transform the school into the shelter. Yeah. And uh, it's the <coughs> least cost. And, uh, but that really saved uh, many lives. Mm -hmm. So you know, you know, let's start from what you can do. Uh, and uh, we can talk about the big number later. But uh, uh, you know, these, these are the sort of the minimum uh, you know, core. How, Rachel, how accessible is all this information to everyone concerned through organizations like the World Bank? I think, I, think it's, uh, I think there's two things going on. One is that there is much more information. There's much more best practice. <coughs> best practice is truly global. Um, you know, we've, got, we've got best practice in Africa, best practice in the Caribbean, the Pacific, Asia. Uh, the Japanese have been absolute um, uh, blazing leaders uh, in, uh, because of their own uh, sense of uh, moral responsibility to the rest of the world, I think, because of what you've experienced in and, and, and they've put enormous funds into making this kind of practice available. Now, through the Open Data Initiative, which led by uh, the United States under President Obama, there's a huge uh, initiative now to put, to put this information up um, in the cloud and from uh, Google uh, Drive all the way through private sector cooperation. I, so I think that increasingly it is. Now, if you're a small holder farmer in the Sahel, you need weather information on your mobile phone at the moment that you're planting. And I think that's also beginning to happen as well. Yeah. So, I, I, so if, if you can there, get that information on your phone in the Sahel region, there's no reason why you shouldn't get, inf assuming the transmission towers are still up, which is not that's something we can't take for granted. But if they are, and you can send out that information, there's no reason why you shouldn't get information on where to get, you know, where the next water source is, where the best shelter is, right. and also filter it back to base, what do we actually need? And increasingly, that's being crowdsourced bottom no. up, right? So, yeah. So, there's also no excuse for sending um, warm weather gear to Haiti after an earthquake, um, for instance, right? So, here's another question that's come through. From, this is from Ethiopia. How can we measure household or community resilience? What are the, what's the list for measuring that? I guess it's a kind of tick list, right? Actually, this is a really good question, which we don't have a full answer to at the moment. Um, in the most concessional window of financing, mm that the bank uh, has, which is the uh, IDA, the International Development uh, Association. So we were replenished last year very, very genu generous, uh, generously by a number of countries. And one of the things that we are committed to doing now 
is developing a resilience indicator so that we will know in everything that we're investing in what kind of resilience we should be getting and, and whether or not we're getting it. Um, and so if our colleague from Ethiopia has actually got some ideas, we're, we're working on that now. So. Mm -hmm. No, uh, this is loss of life. You can then pair it with the type of event, uh, and then that would give you a sense of resilience. It is uh, damage cost. Uh, it is uh, the uh, dis disruption that is happening in in uh, in the uh, loss of channels. So there are some some indicators. It is uh, whether you are able to reduce. Uh, in relative terms, humanitarian aid. Obviously, if you create more resilience, resilient communities, then when a disaster hits, there would be less loss, less, less suffering, less need of humanitarian. They are indicators, but in this audience, we have to say we have now a unique opportunity with the uh, post-MDGs, with the Sustainable Development Goals, to come up with good resilience indicators. An opportunity not to be Missed. Uh, and I saw uh, <coughs> Russia uh, taking notes. Russia is actually one of the people who has been thinking and pushing most actively exactly on, on this issue. How, we, how do we know that it is happening? But also, as you say, no you opportunity tell, you give us the answer. is going well, to tell us in a minute. But, <laughs> but also, as you said, Kristalina, no opportunity should be missed. Mm. And you know, in Justine's speech as well, um, the tsunami in Japan was an example of how preparedness kicked in and then lessons were learned, up to a point. In Haiti, the lessons were clearly not learned. So then you're getting back to politics. How do you ensure, because the information is out there, how do you make sure that that information is put into practice in the places where it matters? You know, when I arrived in Haiti after the earthquake, and we you know, walk around, uh, talk to people, and my conclusion then, and it stands, was as horrible the earthquake was it wasn't Haiti's biggest problem. Haiti's biggest problem were the decades of bad governance. Yeah. Papa dog, baby dog, and you know, all in between. And that the conclusion is that if we want societies to be resilient, we must invest in good governance, we, we must invest in development. This is the best resilience builder. Rachel. Yeah, so I think for, for political leaders, who, who, who want to do uh, and, and are able to do the right thing, we can now, I think, bring, bring a lot more to the table to help them. So an anecdote, uh, when our team was in Nepal um, doing the 3D um, imaging of, uh, of the urban landscape there, and we sat down with the minister and we showed him a 3D map of the city. And from this map, you could see which were the, you know, the most at-risk um, uh, buildings, you know, marked red, etc. That grabs the attention of a leader in a way that nothing else does. Now, if that leader is then, you know, uh, clean-handed and committed and able to do something, then I think that we're now more prepared to assist them. But you know, if that leader is is not in a position or doesn't, or you know, for or whatever reason to move forward, then that, that information isn't going to have that impact. But you, you, we now have more of the tools, more of the understanding, more of the risk. Uh, and our analytical ability to be able to put that into the hands of political leaders. And I think if we've got more financial mechanisms as well than we've ever had, for those leaders who want to act, who understand uh, the investment that resilience will bring, uh, I think we're, we're in a bit of pl better place to help. So them. where's the biggest obstacle to a bright future on this? Ngozi. No, I, I was just thinking uh, some other uh, thought as as well. Maybe this is you the never answer my questions. You always <laughs> what's wrong with my questions, Ngozi? Yeah, I, I answer. I'm trying to move this conversation on. No, I have to. I, I answer what I think I want the audience to know, respective of what you ask. <laughs> hey, that's the job of a journalist. <laughs> I'm, I'm very truthful about that. Yeah, but, I know, can tell. Um, what is the obstacle to a bright future? You know, if you don't have the institutions in the country, and I was just going to think, have we undertaken country by country assessments of the institutional capacity to do this? Mm. It's both leadership but institutions mm -hmm. uh, that you need. I mean, how many countries, cities, communities uh, have the systems, processes, and institutions to assess? what to do and how to prepare. Mm -hmm. You know, so it's okay to show them all the new tricks 
and innovations, but if they don't have <laughs> the capacity to absorb it, an institution that can absorb it and put it to good use, um, then I think that, that that's something that is really missing. So I wanted to ask uh, Rachel and, and, and Kristalina perhaps whether you know, by the EU or the, or the World Bank has done this kind of assessment of institutional preparedness, country by country, you know, to deal with this. Because mm. at the end of the day, I think that's what's needed. I was rather shocked in my own country, pleasantly so, because we are always sometimes on our back foot in these things, that when we had a flood that displaced uh, two million people, nobody, people hardly knew about it, you know? We dealt with it ourselves because Surprisingly, we found that these uh, national emergency management agencies we set up and the state ones were capable of responding more than we thought. So they are not perfect. They have a long way to go, but they managed to kick a little bit into gear to d start dealing with the situation. And now we need to move backwards to have them plan ahead and say, okay, what do we need to put in place? But that got me into thinking that, look, you know, we really need to put more resources in these places mm. to build them up. And that's, to me, the obstacle if we don't have the institutional <laughs> capability. Asenu? Just speaking up from that, uh, uh, our experience in, uh, in uh, Typhoon Haiyan, uh, uh, I think a good part of the uh, um, um, issue here also has to do with cooperation among and coordination among stakeholders and the different actors involved in, mm -hmm. uh, in relief and in uh, uh, recovery and reconstruction. Uh, it, it, it's quite surprising for me, uh, uh, for example, that uh, one week after the uh, Haiyan, after the typhoon, uh, bilateral, multilateral NGOs uh, come to our, came to our office and you know what they were asking? They wanted to do a post-disaster needs assessment. It's one wanting to do a post-disaster needs assessment. And I, and I ask, uh, why can't we just have one post-disaster needs assessment? Mm. And, and, that, uh, and, and let's cooperate, let's coordinate. Sure. But everybody wanted to have a post-disaster needs assessment. Uh, it was, it, 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 it was uh, a really um, a shock for us to, to, to see that all these, many of these uh, different agents flocking into the area, uh, competing for the very limited resources mm. of LGUs mm. because they wanted to do post-disaster need assessments, and it's really a disaster. Okay, uh, disaster uh, within the... And, and, and that's what prompted okay. us. Yeah, right. to, to okay, we're gonna, we're, the, the panel uh, has now ended, I'm sad to say, it's been absolutely fascinating. I'm gonna thank them elaborately at the end of the session, but as the... Um, with Justin Greening was our Amuse Bush. The dessert of the afternoon will be Rajiv Shah. He's the chief administrator of USAID, who's been uh, furiously scribbling away, writing a speech or m amending the existing speech. But uh, thank you very much, Raj. You have the stage, and then after you speak, I'm going to thank everyone, and we can. Okay, have good, a good. Evening. Well, thank you. I. Uh, then I won't thank each of the panelists individually, but I. I want to say that I could easily listen to another. Uh, couple hours of this because it is, it's very engaging, it's very critical, and as we're walking around uh, Washington this, today and, and this uh, coming weekend, you'll notice the cherry blossoms, but I think you're all also noticing these uh, target circles that say end poverty, and uh, it's, a, it's a good bit of branding, and so congratulations to those who came up with that. But the reality is, uh, if we don't kind of figure this out, and if we don't take this challenge of resilience, I, I still think far more seriously than we have even in the past few years when we're meeting and talking about it. Uh, we should not be talking about ending extreme poverty because it's not going to happen uh, unless we figure out how to define success, take forward these strategies, and drive more investment into real institutionally supported resilience strategies that reach the world's most vulnerable communities. And I want to start with just recounting to you that last week, because Ngozi asked the great question of where are the institutions that care? Last week, I was with Secretary uh, Chuck Hagel, our defense secretary, and the ASEAN defense ministers, a uh, minister from your country as well, and we were gathered in Hawaii to go through uh, disaster preparedness. 
And what we found was extraordinary, that the Asia Pacific is hit by half of all natural disasters. The region has spent more than $70 billion responding to these disasters in the last 10 years. Uh, and that these are defense ministers and militaries from throughout the region trying to figure out how do we prepare for these? How do we do a better job of understanding the risks? Where are they likely to happen? How can we connect to satellite imagery provided through NOAA and other scientific institutions so that we can do the types of things you're hearing about here, risk assessments, uh, preparedness, practice, and, and so that the response can be effective and efficient. And so I, I, to some extent, I almost feel that perhaps sometimes our developmental institutions and our humanitarian response uh, institutions are, are still, we still have a ways to go before we are uh, seriously putting the kinds of resources and capabilities into the concept of resilience and actually building the right outcomes in the most vulnerable communities. Uh, I'm sure the panel and others have discussed the UN climate report that once again highlights not just the scale of impending challenge, but the fact that the consequences firmly fall on those who are absolutely most vulnerable and least prepared to deal with them. Uh, and so, you know, we'll spend a, a lot of time today and over the next few days talking about preparing for and trying to muster greater resources and support to respond in and around Syria, to respond in the Central African Republic, in South Sudan, and in the ongoing sets of what, what we will undoubtedly call unprecedented levels of emergency caseload. And they are high. They are higher this year than they have been. So in that regard, they're unprecedented. But if we're surprised by the fact that these disasters occur, that they affect those who are most vulnerable, uh, and if we're surprised by where they occur, then we're simply not looking at 10 years of history that shows that we spend our money in humanitarian disaster relief largely in the same places. 85% of our aggregate spend maps to the same communities year after year after year. So there's really, this is not a field that should be shocked and surprised by new disasters. All we have to do is go back and look at our budgets, our accounts, where our people are deployed, and we can see that this is, it's pretty straightforward. Um, I guess I'll, I'll just make a few points from what I heard on the panel. The concept of risk assessment, which is so critical and so important and we talk about continually, I still think we have more to do to build the kinds of tools that all of us can use together uh, and so that we don't have to have different partners going to try to do uh, risk assessments and needs assessments. These things should be conducted quickly, enabled by technology on open data platforms that everybody is using efficiently and effectively and we move on. Uh, I appreciate the comments, I think Kyoshi's on early warning. Uh, one of the things I think the Philippines can take most pride in is evacuating <coughs> 700,000 people in four days, five days, uh, an extraordinary result that was the, literally the reason why the early reports of, of the number of deaths were so much higher than what was tragically but much lower realized over the course of time. Uh, the sharing of information and best practice, as Rachel points out, there's no reason all of this shouldn't be on open data platforms at, at this point. And, uh, and it is good to see that those best practices, whether they are investments in livestock or new trade agreements between pastoral communities in Eastern Africa and the Gulf, uh, or more specifically, the kinds of things we were talking about in this context, uh, th that should be available to everyone. And I think partnerships like the 100 Resilient Cities that Ngozi mentioned are exactly the right types of platforms so that we can learn from each other, kind of compete with each other, and get serious about making these investments. I'd like to make a point about technology. You know, whether it's the actuarial science that, uh, that powers the insurance products that you, know, you might have been discussing, or the uh, use of satellite imagery to actually do the predictive modeling, uh, we're now seeing the technology be deployed in extraordinary settings. I was in Nepal about a month ago, and you know, the way they're able to use satellite imagery from the United States and other partners to build out uh, rainfall indexed insurance products for small scale farmers, 
the capacity to do that simply didn't exist five years ago. And uh, we've talked about this now a few years. I, I really do hope that the development institutions and the humanitarian partners can make bigger investments in deploying this type of technology more aggressively and more quickly. And, and finally, I'd like to address uh, the question to which I do not have an answer, which is what does success look like? Uh, you know, we do report, and Kristalina's efforts have just been uh, extraordinarily important in this regard, the, the program in the Sahel and, and in the Horn. We have to set targets for ourselves uh, so that we know that we're trying to do things like prevent a million people or two million people from being in need of humanitarian assistance during a crisis or a shock. But that's a very, very rudimentary indicator. And just like we are able to measure income, we're able to measure women's empowerment, we're able to measure the risk of child stunting and nutrition, we ought to have serious uh, community measurement of when communities are genuinely resilient, enough so that standard shocks don't wipe out their capital base and erase a decade of development uh, year after year after year. So thank you for the chance to be with you. I, I guess uh, in conclusion, I would just say, you know, I, I hope that this can serve as a call to action because, uh, you know, the World Bank has done an outstanding job, Rachel, under your leadership in the last few years of really taking this more seriously. Uh, but this year, we are going to deploy more humanitarian resources chasing after more urgent humanitarian need than we have in the last two decades at any point. And that's because we all know where the disasters are. We all know what we're doing to address them. It's going to tax every institution. And if we don't deploy those resources differently, and if we don't change the way we structure our World Bank lending in countries and our bilateral development programs to actually put resources against these resilient strategies, then unfortunately this wonderful gathering and this uh, wonderful insights will, will not be effectively uh, deployed. So thank you for your time and attention. Thank you for doing this. And, and we look forward to continuing to work with you to this end. Thank you very much. Uh, Rajiv, thank you to the panel as well. That was a, it was a really fascinating and interesting discussion. It could have gone on for longer, uh, but it won't. It ends right here. Um, but it's a call to arms, an inspiring call to arms for all of you uh, to do more on this subject. So thank you very much for coming. Have a wonderful evening.